All right, guys, hello. Today we're going to be talking about God's marvelous plan for creation, part three. We're talking about the rich man and Lazarus. If you've ever heard this story, you would know that the rich man and Lazarus is one of the main texts used to describe eternal torment. And in the parable, Yeshua, or Jesus, talks of a rich man who dies and goes to Hades, um, or hell, in quotations. The rich man is contrasted with a poor man named Lazarus, who dies and goes to Abraham's bosom. Now, this is commonly interpreted as heaven. The common view is taken as a literal picture of the after afterlife, rather than as a kingdom parable in need of interpretation. Yet, this story is the climax of a series of five different parables of the kingdom, which Luke arranges in a particular order to try to make his point. So if we take Lazarus out of its context, then, um, especially with the other parables, then we're sure to misinterpret it. Here are the five parables. We got the parable of the lost sheep, which is seen in Luke 15, 3 through 7. We have the parable of the lost coin, which is Luke 15, 8 through 10. The, the prodigal son, which is 15, Luke 15, 11 through 32. The unjust steward, which is Luke 16, 1 through 13. And then the rich man and Lazarus, which is Luke 16, 19 through 31. After the fourth parable, the unjust steward, we are told in Luke 16, 14, that the Pharisees were lovers of money. They were scoffing at him and he said to them. So the fifth parable was directed at the Pharisees. They are the rich man. Even so, the parable is not with, about rich going to hell and the poor going to heaven. It is a parable of the kingdom, which has its roots in the Old Testament. The first kingdom of God was called Israel. And we're going to start our series, guys. So we're talking about the lost sheep of Israel. The first parable in the series is about how Jesus, Yeshua, left the 99 to go and find the one sheep that was, had run away. The prophet in Jeremiah 56 says, my people have become lost sheep. So the sheep are people. It's symbolic. Jesus' parable was mainly taken from Ezekiel chapter 34, where the prophet wrote a whole chapter about the lost sheep of Israel. In Ezekiel 34, 6, we see uh, this big problem here. So it speaks, My flock wandered all through the mountains and on every hill. My flock was scattered over the surface of the earth, and there was no one to search or seek for them. God scolded the preachers, the preachers and the prophets for refusing to go look for these lost sheep. And many today apply this to the work of evangelism, which is... A proper application. However, it is much, much more than that because the prophet was speaking of the Israelites who had been deported to Assyria in 712 BC. Because the preachers and prophets throughout history did not search for these lost sheep, God said in Ezekiel 34 11, I myself will search for the sheep and I will seek them out. Verse 16 adds, I will seek the lost and bring the scattered, bind up the broken, and strengthen the sick. The parable in Luke 15 shows that Yeshua, or Jesus, is the one who is fulfilling this prophecy in Ezekiel. The good shepherd who seeks for a sheep is Jesus, or Yeshua. The sheep are the lost Israelites, along with others who will be gathered with the Israelites. Isaiah 56, 8 talks about this. It says, The Lord God who gathers the dispersed of Israel, declares this, Yet others I will gather to them who are already gathered. This context shows that God intends to gather people, not only Israelites, because he says in the previous verse, My house shall be a house of prayer for all the peoples. And also we see through Abraham, through your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Super important to understand this, guys. For this reason, Jesus, Yeshua, told his disciples to do a mission trip 
and go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. We see this in Matthew chapter 10, verse 6. He was not sending them to the Jews in Judea. He was sending them many miles north where the Israelites had been relocated when the Assyrians came and took them captive. And again, that was in 721 BC. The parable of the lost sheep is followed by a second parable about the lost coin. It is essentially the same as the first parable because it once again refers to the lost Israelites. Exodus 19.5 calls Israel a segula. This is Hebrew for treasure. This treasure is made up of people who are chosen and who represent, who are represented by the coin. Yeshua also told another coin parable in Matthew 13, 44, which is similar to the theme of the lost coin. He said in Matthew 13, 44, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. The meaning here is very clear, guys. Israel was like a treasure hidden in a field. Yeshua said, Jesus said in Matthew 13, 38, that the field is the world. Israel was lost and hidden in the world because no one bothered to find the lost sheep of Israel. We read that Yeshua bought the whole field. He bought the world in order to obtain the hidden treasure. When he bought the field, then he could lay claim to all that was hidden in it. This shows that Jesus, Yeshua, died for the whole world. We see this in 1 John 2 and 2. He's not, and we see this also in 1 Timothy, that he is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. And in doing so, he died for the whole world in his quest to recover the treasure, which is Israel. The third parable is about an unjust steward. This story has been super misunderstood because people don't know who that steward is. There are two nations that Yeshua talked about in his parables. The first one was Israel. The second one was Judah or Judea, where the Pharisees and other religious leaders scoffed at him. We see this in Luke 16, 14. Now the Pharisees who were lovers of money were listening to all these things and they were scoffing at him. When Israel was deported to Assyria in 721 BC and later dispersed throughout the nations, the people of Judah remained in the land for another century. A century later, God allowed the Babylonians to conquer Judah and resettle the people in Babylon for 70 years. And we see this in Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 11. The whole land will be a desolation and a horror and these nations will serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. After 70 years, God allowed the Judeans, the Jews, to return back to the old land because 500 years later, Yeshua had to be born in Bethlehem in Judea. And we see this in Luke chapter 2, verses 4. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the family of David, and David was of the house and family of Judah. All right. Certainly, this is why the prophets never say that the people of Judah were lost. Certainly, they were lost in a spiritual sense unless they had the genuine faith in Messiah and Christ. However, they were never a lost as a nation. Even though they later lost their nation status, they always remained a distinct and were well known to everyone. The parable of the unjust steward was directed at the religious leaders of the Jews who had become rich while oppressing the lower class Jews. Yeshua often exposed their corruption and drove them out of the temple on two occasions. We see this in John chapter 2 verse 15 and Matthew chapter 21 verses 12. The unjust steward pictured the corrupt nation of Judah and its corrupt priests and other religious leaders. So we see that there are two main characters 
in Yeshua's parables, Israel and Judah. The division between them had occurred thousands of years earlier when the nation was divided after the death of Solomon. There were two brothers in the parable of the prodigal son. One Israel left home. The other Judah stayed home. The one who stayed home again represented Judah. The one who left home represented Israel. The prodigal son, Israel, spent all of his money and then finally returned home. And when he returned, his father ran and welcomed him and they celebrated his return. The older brother, Judah, complained that his brother was getting more attention than he deserved. His father answered, this brother of yours was dead and now has begun to live, was lost and has been found. Luke 15, 32. It is clear that the prodigal son is also the lost sheep and also the lost coin in the parables we just talked about. The older brother is Judah and also he is the unjust steward of the previous parable. This also explains why the Pharisees scoffed at Yeshua's parable. They knew he was talking about them. With this background in mind, now we are in position to better understand the last parable in these series. The rich man represents Judah and Lazarus represents the poor man. It is Israel. As you can see, the story is a kingdom parable. It is, speaks of the time after each nation was destroyed. It is not only a story about the after, it is not a story about the afterlife of individual people. Super, super clear. I'm going to say that again. It is not a story about the afterlife of individual people, but it is a kingdom parable with symbolic references to Judah and to Israel. Having identified the characters, we can now understand some of the details of this story. So Lazarus is pictured as a beggar at the gate. He was outside the house, right where we would expect him to be, because Israel was outside the house after the Assyrians deported them and resettled them into a foreign land. We see this happen in 721 BC. Luke chapter 16, 21 says that Lazarus was longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. We know that the food represents the word of God. Man does not live on bread alone, but every word that comes out of the mouth of God. And that's Matthew 4, 4. In captivity far away, the Israelites were suffering from a famine for hearing the words of the Lord. And Amos 8.11 gives us these exact words. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land. Not a famine for bread or for a thirst for water, but rather for hearing the words of the Lord. So you understand that he was famished because they, this poor man was famished. He longed to have that bread, but because he was outside the gate, just like the tribe of Israel was scattered by the Assyrians, there was a famine of the word of God. Lazarus' only friends were the dogs, it says. In those days, the Jews referred to non-Jews as dogs, as we see in Matthew chapter 15, 26, when Yeshua, even himself, a Jew, refers to a Gentile as a dog. And he said, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Israel was living among foreign nations. This is the setup for the parable, guys. And then we read that the rich man and Lazarus each died. Sad. Israel had already died as a nation more than 700 years earlier when they were taken captive. Judah was soon to die about 40 years later when the Roman army destroyed the temple in 70 AD. Each nation had a different fate as prophesied by the scriptures. So the lost Israelites would be to be regathered and used as a basis for the kingdom of God. So Lazarus himself is, is pictured in the bosom of Abraham. Now, what does Abraham represent, guys? Abraham represents the man of faith. Abraham represents the children of faith. The real sons of Abraham, as we see in Galatians 3, 7, therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith 
who are the sons of Abraham. These receive the promises given to Abraham by faith through the new covenant brought to them by none other than Yeshua Messiah, Jesus Christ. The nation of Judah, however, represented by the rich man, suffers an entirely different fate. The rich man finds himself in torment, in Hades, hell. This does not mean that Jews go to hell. It refers to the Jewish condition since the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. The nation, the Jewish nation died in torment, guys, ever since that time. Their temple was destroyed, their city was destroyed. And furthermore, the rich man is said to have called out to Abraham and talked with him. Is this really possible? If this were a story about a man going to hell after he died, could there be such a communication? I don't think so. The rich man just wanted a tiny bit of water to cool his tongue. Both water and food represents the word of God, as we see in scriptures that Christ has loved the church and has washed her by the washing of the water of the word. Isn't that right, guys? And again, we see that man does not live by bread alone, but every, every word that comes out of the mouth of God. We see that in Matthew 4.4. 4. The rich man needed a lot of water. And in fact, Yeshua says in John chapter 4 to the woman in Samaria, he says to her, out of, whoever receives the water that I give him will never thirst again. He says out of their belly would flow rivers of living water. See, this rich man, this rich man who represents Judah, needed more than just a little bit of water. But the rich, but he only really wanted a tiny bit of it. So also today, the Jews claim to know the word of God, but in reality, by rejecting Christ, they really only want a little bit of water. They don't want the fullness. And we know that Christ also is symbolic of the rock that was stricken by, by Moses. And out of this rock came water. And that represents Christ. But if we reject Christ, it shows that they only wanted a little bit of water. The rich man asked the truth to be sent to his five brothers. Is it a coincidence that Judah himself had five brothers? Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, and Zebulon. See Genesis 29 and 32 to 30, 20. All others of his brothers were actually half brothers being born by different mothers. The rich man said if someone would come back from the dead, his brothers would listen to him and believe the truth. But Abraham responded in Luke chapter 16, verse 31, if they do not listen to Moses, if they don't, do not listen to the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. Can I tell you that someone rose from the dead? Jesus rose from the dead, and yet they did not listen to him. Yeshua rose from the dead, and yet they did not listen. Instead, the gospel tells us that they spread a lie to deceive their own people. We see this in Matthew 28, verse 13 and 15, which says, you are to say to his disciples, that his disciples, or you are to say, his disciples came this night, him by night, and these are the, the Pharisees are speaking to the, t the guards of the tomb. And if this should come to the governor's ears, we will win him over and keep you out of trouble. And they took the money and they did as they were instructed. And this, is what the rich man and Lazarus teaches us. It is not about an eternal, tormentous death, but it is about Judah and Israel. And the, it's a kingdom parable. Hope that helps you guys. Put your hand on my shoulder. Lead me in your baby.